recommend to all of my panelists to mute themselves when they're not speaking because uh, I hear room noises. Um, oh, I actually hear water running. But I guess the problem is the person who's running the water is not listening to me. So, um, okay. We are recording, and I would like to welcome you uh, to this uh, presentation of the Site Impact Handbook webinar series. And this is uh, something that uh, is mentioned in the Site Impact Handbook, but it is, uh, it is not uh, a subject that uh, has been fully discussed in the handbook because it is still a work in progress. And it is the uh, initiative of Complete Streets that um, the department is, is heavily involved in right now. And those of you that uh, have been following access management for a while know um, that we have beliefs in, in that we uh, almost count as dogma. And uh, the whole complete streets movement, the whole context sensitive uh, philosophy has caused many of us to uh, reflect on our uh, beliefs and maybe even to question them. Uh, we're at the beginning of a process. We are definitely interested in your comments and questions. Uh, before we begin, there are usually some questions uh, about whether we can get a presentation to you. And in a day or two, we should have a PDF handout of this presentation. Uh, those of you that need credits for the American Planning Association, this is the number you're going to want to um, copy down in order to get your one and a half hours of, of credits. And uh, let me move on. And I also want to let you know that uh, We've been, we've been having these the third Thursday of the month over the last year or so, and we, I'm going to try to move it to the second Thursday of the month. But as always, if we can get a special speaker that can do it at another time, you will be notified. All right, so just wanted you to know that. I'd like to introduce um, our staff today. Uh, my name is Gary Sokolow. And I'm with the Florida Department of Transportation. You may know me as the access management person. Uh, I deal in the section that also is heavily involved in level of service models and standards, as well as uh, site impact. And, um, and we work with Maria Cahill uh, directly in the field of growth management. Uh, with us today, we have the leader of the Complete Streets Initiative with us, Dwayne Carver. And my hope is that he can weigh in and answer questions and add to uh, things that I say that uh, uh, might need to be added on to. So uh, the other thing is that w when you uh, write questions, you can, uh, you can ask Dwayne. Okay, Gina Bonyani is not here today because uh, she's in Washington, D.C., uh, working on a, um, a committee that is looking, that is looking at the impacts of access management on multimodal travel. So it fits right into uh, what we're studying today, but she can't make it. Um, Andrew uh, is not here today. Uh, though he is usually our, our master of ceremonies. Uh, Nathan Hicks of CDM Smith is uh, the person who uh, has helped put so many of these together, and uh, he's here to, uh, to help out also in answering questions and, and uh, taking care of uh, making sure this, this goes 
uh, accordingly. Now, Michael Stafford is a new person that is working very closely with us, and uh, that's him at the end. He works for CDM Smith, and he's been helping me out uh, in in these issues of access management, trip generation, uh, level of service and training. His background is uh, from the University of Florida. He worked for the T-Square Center. Um, I'm not sure, do they still call it T-Square Center? Am I, Michael? Yeah, they still do. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So the T-Square Center, for some of you that, that uh, might not know, is the University of Florida's uh, transportation technical um, uh, beyond college, aside from college education on uh, things uh, like maintenance of traffic, all the way up to they have courses in access management and site impact also. Um, and so we're very pleased to have him because uh, he's helped organize a lot of the training and, and uh, he had to keep his within budget and uh, uh, also um, their training was not free, so it was very important so, uh, for to keep in budget. But for us, uh, we never charge for any of our training. It makes things easier on us, believe me. Okay, the way we participate today is through that, that question box. Um, your control panel has a lot of features on it. Uh, you can close it up if it's taking too much of your screen by hitting that uh, grab bar arrow. Uh, you can open up, uh, you can switch between using the telephone if your uh, microphone and speakers aren't working well. Uh, you just need to call some sort of uh, number out in South Dakota. And you can have it auto-hide or stop it from auto-hiding. Uh, there are places where you can check your, your uh, audio. And, but this is the important thing. This is where the questions come in that we try to answer. And as I said uh, earlier, before we were opening up, uh, we have uh, uh, a pretty informal and we'll stop and, and answer questions along the way. All right, so complete streets. Uh, for those of you who attendees out there. Um, when I say complete streets, do you have a, an idea of what we're talking about? Is this something that you've actually worked with? Raise your hand if it's a yes. Okay. All right. I'm seeing a, a scattering. Oh, more than a scattering. I guess I, uh, the computer needed to, to, to get all the, uh, the data together, but I'm very pleased. It's uh, Complete Streets has been uh, a part of our, our uh, profession here now for at least, at least five years for those of us that have kind of been in the dark, uh, like myself. Uh, and the thing about working for a State Department of Transportation uh, is that sometimes we fear change. And um, so we need to be convinced that something is a good thing. When I would tell people that I'm involved with the um, Complete Streets implementation, um, really the, one of the first things we hear is, oh, Goodness gracious, um, does this mean we're going to have uh, um, all of our streets looking like that? Because that's ridiculous, you know? I mean, our, our highways that go between cities are not going to have uh, Parisian uh, cafes, and uh, I'm not going to be riding my Vespa on it. Um, and it was uh, Dwayne Carver in a presentation I saw last year who said that complete streets are streets that serve who they are supposed to serve. Uh, this is a two-lane highway that runs between um, some uh, rural cities, rural towns. It's high speed. 
uh, you don't expect to get many cyclists or, or pedestrians out there. This is a complete street. And as Dwayne has, has said when he shows pictures like this, it already proves that the Department of Transportation can build complete streets because this is a complete street. Now, this is also a complete street in the city of Fort Lauderdale. And this is an appropriate street uh, for an appropriate context. Really, when we're talking about complete streets, we're talking about, again, not the Parisian cafes and not even, and the other thing I get is we have a new wider uh, buffered bike lane that is becoming the standard where we build bike lanes. And uh, many of the, the people that I've worked with will say, my God, how, can we, how are we going to fit everything in there? Well, uh, we don't. We don't. Uh, let me just say that complete streets are better described serving our users in a more appropriate and safe manner. But be aware, not everyone can be equally served everywhere. That's why we do have different kinds of roadways. To answer the question about does this mean that, that there will be a bike, eight foot buffered bike lane uh, everywhere that now uh, uh, says it needs to be a complete street, and the answer is no. Uh, what was most appropriate in this case was a um, uh, a feature called a Sharo, a shared uh, bike auto lane. And one of the uh, examples of a uh, road diet where they've taken uh, lanes, uh, through lanes off of a roadway uh, is an Edgewater Drive in Orlando. Uh, it's, a, it's a great cycling environment. However, there are no bike lanes. Now, some of us in the uh, profession also uh, know if we're trying to uh, uh, serve everybody that uses uh, our right of way, you can see here uh, who has the priority, uh, especially when um, the alligators are coming up over the, uh, the right of way there. Uh, so the, the hikers and bikers really should move closer to the alligators. Now, for those of us that have been working with the department for the last 10 years or more, uh, you might be familiar with some of the uh, um, some of the, the policies and processes that we have done to become more sensitive to context in the past. We uh, as part of our plans preparation manual, we have a section called uh, Design for livable communities. In the Florida Green Book, we have an entire chapter on traditional neighborhood development. And uh, Roadway Design has a document out uh, called uh, Traditional Neighborhood Development, also their handbook. And we have a policy called Context-Sensitive context Solutions. So, you know, the thing was, haven't we heard this before? Um, and what comes to mind is a, a friend of mine from the Center for Urban Transportation uh, Research, Christine Williams, uh, when we discuss uh, our projects together, said something that she said, we have enough handbooks. We need to now start putting them into action. And I believe that the complete streets policy is something that will get all of these things you see here as something that can come together and we can have some action on. So here's the complete streets policy. I'm not going to read it all to you, but the part that's in yellow is, is very important. And it says that it will be integrating the department's uh, internal manuals, guidelines, or mandated documents uh, in planning, design, construction, and operations. So they're saying this is, will touch everybody. 
not just planning, not just design. And um, it was heavily supported by um, Anath Prasad, our previous uh, secretary, and continues to be um, supported heavily by Jim Boxold, our current uh, secretary. He had just back in December, uh, this is a, a press release. Um, not, again, I'm not going to read it to you, but it, it fully supports what we're trying to do. So uh, early last year, uh, there was a, a push to, to map out implementation. We had a series of uh, workshops in which uh, people from local government, people from DOT, and private enterprise worked with a group that you may have heard of, Smart Growth America, um, to see what's, what's holding us back. What's holding us back? What can we do better? And uh, the result of it was this report called the Complete Streets Implementation Plan. And I wish I could tell you all the answers are in it, uh, but they're not. It really is the beginning, it is truly the beginning of the process that we had. And uh, I am going to send you a link. Now, when you get this uh, report, it will have a link to everything you see here. And my computer is operating a bit slow on this. Okay. Well, I will get that link to you if you need it after the meeting. Uh, matter of fact, I will put it, at the, these links that are in here, I'll, uh, you will get them even before you get the presentation. All right. Um, now, knowing that complete streets are not just uh, those uh, uh, fancy um, cafes, uh, what is our goal? And the goal is to have context-appropriate streets. And some roads are for high speeds. But even though we have roads for high speeds, that doesn't negate the need to better serve our pedestrians and transit users. And um, these, these are the things that we're trying to do. And one of the things that our office is committed to doing, especially uh, when it comes to access management and uh, the things that, that we work with directly. Slowing traffic is not appropriate on all highways. You need to have the right conditions. You need to have the support of the local governments. Uh, the good news is, is that many of the local governments have actually been pushing us. It's not, it hasn't been the local governments not wanting it. The local governments uh, many times have been pushing back on us. Um, something to remember that uh, even slowing uh, speeds uh, a bit on a long trip uh, doesn't always lead to noticeable decreases in travel time for long trips. Uh, I was at a meeting a few weeks ago uh, where someone uh, was saying that when we mention uh, some of the, the new beliefs here in context-sensitive design and uh, complete streets that, uh, oh, so we're just getting rid of the whole concept of, of a high-speed at-grade arterial, and it's not true. Um, but we have to, to look at different ways uh, to, to get to the problems that we, we have today of mobility and safety. Uh, think of this, if a trip from Jacksonville to Tampa takes an extra 15 minutes because it needs to go slowly through some towns that want to have a slow speed limit and something that is uh, more appropriate for pedestrian travel, how much difference is really is that going to make? Uh, especially if those slow trips are during the four hours of peak time uh, 
and and not during the the other uh, parts of the day. So it's not the end of the world as we know it. And to get to some of the the changes that might happen in access management, I figured that uh, before we went too long, I would actually tell you what I thought they might be. And I'll tell you that that when I go through these, I I, I see uh, people uh, questioning me. And uh, but one is to uh, remove or revise our signal spacing standards. Um, this is related to uh, block size, grid size, uh, that, that long signal spacings are not always uh, the best thing, especially where we need to have pedestrians uh, crossing. Okay, and currently our standards for signal spacing are fairly high. Um, we need to look at our driveway design standards to see how they can better serve pedestrians and cyclists as well as transit users. And we may actually need to do some work with our administrative rule uh, to include safe um, pedestrian access as a necessity, as a right, uh, the same way as we do for vehicles. A uh, number of years ago, I read this article that uh, called access management the enemy, um, and I, I was I was hurt, and uh, it was a, a very uh, different kind of experience, and and and, and it really made me uh, be a bit retrospective, and uh, and I can tell you I think that that there are things that need to be changed. We just talked about them. But access management uh, is not the enemy. Might need to have some, some readjustment, as I said. Uh, anybody who says access management is uh, the enemy of good urban design uh, needs to look at this picture. And on the other hand, and in the same, in the same vein, when we think about good walkable communities, there are not many driveways there. There are not many driveways. Uh, most of the driveways uh, are on side streets and not the main street. And not only downtown big cities, but even small towns like this in Newberry, you can see there's, there's, uh, there's side streets. There's, there's not driveways there. By restricting uh, driveway access, we are uh, making the pedestrian environment safer. We know that we need to, uh, since access management is all about um, reducing conflict, we need to think about just uh, not just reducing the conflict between automobiles and vehicles, but also about the other users of the roadway. Our driveway designs really need uh, re-looking at. Uh, this is uh, a place near where I live, uh, and there's a driveway that did actually put a sidewalk down one side, and I applaud them for it, but uh, they didn't on the other side, and so what happens is a person going down this sidewalk, in order to use the sidewalk, has to now cross the driveway. And let's say they, they just really uh, want to go to the Publix over to the bottom left. Uh, they'll just drive, you know, walk down here without the uh, sidewalk, and then the car coming in quickly uh, realizes there is a pedestrian in the lane. So we need to think about that. Uh, uh, driveways are for pedestrians also. Some of you know that Florida has come out on uh, pretty much the top for the number of pedestrian deaths and injuries uh, in the country. You can argue that it's because of our weather, um, but that has not stopped us from making this a very large job because we do not want to be at the top of that list anymore. Um, if you take a look at, um, you know, we've made national news 
and the people in national news uh, had, took a look at the roadways where most of these pedestrian deaths were, and they will say right then and there, it is the fact that they lacked restrictive medians. Uh, we have done plenty of study here over the last, oh good goodness, 20 years about the benefits of restrictive medians. Uh, and this is one from uh, uh, International University and with uh, Albert Gann and Priyanka. Uh, Aluri from uh, Florida International University, and uh, they looked at uh, eight corridors that had have had a median placed in them. There, there were no other improvements except the median, and you might be able to tell from the screen that not only did the number of the crashes decrease. Um, afterwards, but that the severity decreased. And, and we're going to find severity is is something that's very uh, very important. Uh, Appalachian Parkway, uh, that's in Tallahassee, a number of years ago was in portions of seven lane section, a pretty scary place uh, for pedestrians. You can see a few of them uh, in the middle of the street. Um, the scary part is that they're going from uh, a happy hour to the only place they could park, which was across the street at the time. Uh, through the tenacity of, of uh, the uh, traffic engineer, the city of Tallahassee at the time, Debbie Danton, uh, got everybody on board to uh, make this state highway uh, one with a restrictive median. You can see this is not what people think of when they think of complete streets. However, just putting in that median in made it safer for pedestrians, and that's what we're going for also. Uh, the crash rate before and after the construction dramatically decreased. Back in 1988, and I know because I was here in 1988, uh, when we put together the access management standards, we really only considered two kinds of, of land, the generally developing or undeveloped and the generally developed. Uh, I had since come to realize that many state DOTs have this problem where in their design, uh, standards, they really only recognize suburban and rural. And uh, I would say a good number of state DOTs are now looking at the fact that there are more than that. And uh, that's where we bring up the concept of the transect. Uh, this is a um, a concept that was uh, part of the new urbanism uh, philosophy that there are different zones and each of these zones should have uh, different uh, requirements for everything from drainage to building to uh, um, park area and and also transportation so uh, this is just a uh, small representation of a, of a typical transect going from a natural zone down to the urban core. And I know a number of local governments in the state of Florida have already adopted this sort of uh, concept for their zoning. Uh, this is Miami's uh, transect here, and there is a link to uh, part of their code there. Um, I'm going to uh, stop right now and see if there are questions that need to be answered. Nathan? Um, no, there are not any questions right now. Really? Okay. Then I'm going to ask... <laughs> I'm going to ask Dwayne Carver, is there anything you'd like to add to me here? 
No, you're doing great. Please, okay, uh, okay. Well, I want to get I, I want to get this Miami slide from you after the show. Though, so. Okay, good, good. Well, really, that means a lot coming from you. Thank you. Um, but most most of my uh, stuff is from the from the magic of uh, Google searches and. Uh, So, something that I found out from Duane two days ago is the importance of a document that I never bothered to print out until yesterday. And that was the 2010 Institute of Transportation Engineers document called Designing Walkable Urban Thoroughfares, a context-sensitive approach. Uh, you will see a link there. It is a free document, which is very unlike ITE to give something away for free, and I say that as a member, um, but it is a very thought-provoking um, handbook uh, guide that might play a role, a, a large role, in, in what we do here uh, at DOT, and I know for even ac for access management. Uh, they have come up with a similar transect, but they call them context zones. It's pretty much the same thing. Uh, they call them C zones. And the um, American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, lovingly known as AASHTO, um, I found out is working on their own context zones, uh, which is the next thing in um, the evolution of the transportation in, uh, industry um, embracing context-sensitive design. Uh, if you think about the transect, one of the things that was left out was the small rural town and they're going to have that in there. Uh, I'm not going to go uh, into this very heavily, but because you can hardly see it, but it, within the ITE's context zones, they do have some guidance for access management. And now, I guess I'm going to have to uh, see how it can help us. Um, people in the access management community have also started working on the uh, how access management can uh, benefit from the philosophy of the transect. Uh, when you get the PDF of this presentation, uh, you will also get a link to the presentation that was made uh, on this uh, by uh, Brad Strader, who is a, a big context sensitive uh, proponent engineer who's also on the National Access Management Committee. And I, I'll recommend that you look at that. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we here in this office actually uh, looked at a, it, we didn't call it a transect, but we, we looked at uh, something similar where driveway settings and the importance of, of different modes. Uh, so in, in the dense major urban areas, the uh, auto would be medium rather than high, and then the walking uh, mode would be high. Um, this is really just a draft, and it was uh, something that we put together, but I have a feeling uh, this is going to go into a transect uh, type um, concept soon as we work on it. Access management has, has done a great job over the last 30 years, and I should know because I've been part of that, uh, for getting cars quickly and safely and efficiently in and out of businesses, and we are very proud of what we did. But on occasion, and more than just on an occasion, we forgot about the poor pedestrian. So... Um, now with uh, certain uh, Americans uh, dis with Disability uh, Act provisions, we're seeing more accessible paths to businesses. And I believe that 
uh, we in access management need to, to be proponents of this also. Uh, Deborah Tyrone from our Orlando office uh, shared with me uh, a number of these these slides of uh, of things that we could do better. Uh, one of these is, if you can see on the left, is a, a sidewalk um, you know, going to a store into the driveway, but there seems to be a gap there. Um, the picture to the right. Uh, showing that uh, same walkway from a different angle of the Dunkin' Donuts uh, shows how a ramp was built from the uh, major sidewalk to get there. Uh, the next pictures that she shared with me uh, were from a, a newly built um, uh, fueling and convenience market superstation. And um, what she did is she took pictures that showed that, uh, I don't know well, how well you can see it, but the uh, bus stop is uh, right, th right there on the sidewalk. And uh, knowing the bus schedules in most of, uh, of Florida, uh, you get there at a certain time, you know you got about 30 minutes to wait. And I'm sure that person uh, with the bicycle sometimes might want to get a Coca-Cola. Uh, in, in that gas station, even though they're not buying gas. And the only way for them to get in uh, was kind of just to make their way through the landscaping there. Uh, we need to do a better job than that. Uh, this is another driveway that uh, Deborah Tyrone pointed out to me. Uh, um, we didn't ask them to put driveways down into the businesses and uh, and and perhaps our standards don't ask for it but sometimes local governments do but in this case even if we couldn't ask them to do it by allowing uh, the um, utility poles to be put uh, right there uh, where the sidewalk would be just makes it that much more difficult to do. Uh, one of the the big things that we've known for a long time is that curb radii for access management uh, in driveways has a, a large effect on the conflicts between cars turning in and out and the pedestrians wanting to cross because uh, the smoother it is uh, for the automobile, um, the faster they're going and also the longer the pedestrian has to uh, longer the pedestrian has to to be in that zone of conflict uh, this is just a, a small portion from the Abu Dhabi street mat the street design manual if you have not heard of it um, do google it um, it's probably one of the best uh, overall documents like this uh, that I've uh, I've seen in many years, and uh, this is just showing you how driveways can be built with the sensitivity of different users. Uh, you can see that the uh, sidewalk here uh, does meet the ADA standards, um, and because of the the large trucks that come in, they've built a texturized concrete area that helps channelize. Uh, automobile traffic, so they're they're serving the automobile traffic and the truck traffic when it comes, uh, without making it a free for all area for uh, pedestrians crossing. Uh, one of the suggestions that we probably will have, if you're familiar with our standard designs, uh, they're very important. Uh, a lot of times uh, we just follow our. It's called a standard index. And we follow what's in there. And uh, perhaps we should show sidewalks uh, to businesses in our design standards. Um, directional median openings, if you are a follower of access management, we love them. Uh, never realized that they were causing a problem at unsignalized intersections for pedestrians who needed to cross. 
Um, one of the answers that is being used around the country, and here this is a, a Tampa District 7 example. Um, Peter Shue, who is in the safety office of our District 7, uh, sent these pictures to me. Now you can see this is, I believe, uh, Fowler Avenue. Um, hardly a, a complete street, uh, but heavily used by pedestrians and uh, people using uh, transit. If you uh, get on the bus in the morning here, um, then you get off the bus here, and if you didn't have a signal, you had to go all the way down to the signal legally to do it, and then um, we know what people were doing. Uh, but th uh, this safety improvement actually put a diagonal crosswalk and special uh, lighting for uh, the pedestrian crossing and it's been very successful. As you can tell, this is pretty typical of Florida and I see no cafes, uh, at least on the sidewalks there. The next big thing that might impact what we do here in this office is level of service. Uh, this is a, a, a very um, um, cynical uh, cartoon of, of uh, how the level of service standards has helped bulldoze down uh, the city, um, but I just thought you'd want to see that. Uh, so where are we headed? Again, it is the Complete Streets Implementation Plan, which, is a, a, again, is a beginning and not an ending. Uh, we do understand that um, you can't build lanes, you can't build your way out of congestion. People don't behave that way. Well, actually, who says you can't build uh, your way out of congestion? Because uh, here's one place in uh, Burma where they obviously have built their way out of uh, congestion. Uh, but it's important to, to understand that uh, that's not what we want. And uh, the, uh, uh, the idea here is that, that we, we know this is not uh, what we want. This is a, a road that uh, is really built for um, military shows, and I'm sure it does a good job of that. Uh, for a number of years, we've had some form of a level of service uh, standards, uh, and uh, we have a level of service policy currently, which is much simpler than the administrative rule we had a number of years ago. And um, as I said, this is fairly simple. It's, it's D for urbanized areas and C for outside the urbanized areas. Um, and uh, once again, we're really good with two kinds of areas, but maybe we need more. So some screenshots from the implementation plan is that we should clarify that level of service is just one of the many considerations. It's not it's not the only thing, and that we need to find a way to include uh, flexibility uh, for different levels of service. Uh, California has has uh, gotten rid of its level of service standards, and we're still trying to see uh, how that's going. Our level of service handbook does have uh, ways to, at a planning level, determine level of service for, for bicycles, pedestrians, and buses. It's fairly simplistic, but it was made for uh, coming up with estimates of the level of service for large areas. This is one concept that I've been seeing uh, batted around uh, on uh, different papers, is that depending on the transect or context zone, in this case an urban activity center, that each of these modes 
up here from uh, pedestrian, cyclists, cars, trucks, and buses would have a desired overall performance. And then your report card would be uh, this way, but it would, it would tell you how you were doing not just with one mode. And that's one way we've seen uh, where some local governments are going. And it wouldn't surprise me uh, it, that something like that isn't done in Florida right now. Um, the other thing that, that we're seeing now because of this is the need for, for more and different data. Uh, just to use what we currently have in our level of service handbook, um, we need to have uh, pavement condition on street parking and the good news is is that our roadway characteristics inventory people have added sidewalks and have added bike lanes a pretty detailed um, layer uh, on our graphical information and we are using it and it will be used uh, to, to help measure our success or, or not success with uh, how we want to go with complete streets uh, the other is there's there's more and more uh, emphasis to try to get um, governments to study not just the regular trip generation that we're used to, vehicle trip generation, but uh, uh, modal trip generation, person trip generation. Um, this was done uh, in the state of California in areas very close to um, the BART stations, the Bay Area Rapid Transit. So you can see they've they've looked at the percentage of trips by, by uh, auto, transit, walk and bicycle. Now this is a pretty uh, um, transit oriented area. Uh, the other thing is uh, the technology is changing uh, and uh, we're going to be doing better and better counts of, of uh, trip person trip generation in the stores. This is uh, the use of, of radar, I believe. It's a company called Placemeter. And uh, if you go to uh, that link, and I don't know if it'll work if everybody goes at the same time, it is absolutely fascinating. Well, there we go. I'm going to send that link out, hopefully. Again, not having luck. Anyway, you will get this link. You will get this link so you can see it because in motion it's counting uh, not only pedestrians but pedestrians going into the different stores and it, it can uh, detect the difference between a passenger automobile and a taxi. So why do we even bother going through this? And uh, here's the reason. Um, sometimes our profession needs to have people from outside the profession to tell us to do a better job. Uh, this was back in 2004. New Orlando Sentinel uh, discovered that State Road 50 uh, through Central Florida had one of the uh, highest crash rates in the entire state. And matter of fact, that there was a portion of State Road 50, and we'll just call it uh, Section 5 here because it was this is the way it was in the paper. Um, had an even higher uh, death rate than than the average. And um, here's something that the newspaper did, is they mapped uh, from the year 2001 to 2004 the number of deaths on the entire State Road 50 through Central Florida. There were lots of them, but just for this one small section, this is near State Road 436, Samaran Boulevard, and, and uh, Colonial Boulevard, State Road 50, each of those red squares with a number is a person, is a death that happened 
uh, between 2001 and 2004, and something that our statistics don't always show are the people's names, their ages, and what they were doing when they died. And you, you take a look at the number of tried to turn left, tried to walk across, and you can see at that time there were no, no medians there. And can't say that all these people would have been saved, but we know uh, quite a few of them would be. And uh, I just wanted to point that out, that sometimes we need to personalize what's going on here. We're, we are not just statisticians and, and scientists, but we are here to make life better. And I believe the complete streets and the changes it will have on uh, site impact analysis and access management will be ones that will definitely save people's lives. So with that, um, that's my... Uh, my presentation and I was uh, wondering if we had questions or comments and I uh, would be happy and not just me but but since uh, um, Duane is is on board here um, I see that there are some questions Nathan um. No, there's uh, no additional questions. Okay. Uh, two people just commenting saying uh, thanks for the material or links. Cool. And and we will get those links out to you um, today or tomorrow, and we will get the presentation out to you in two days, and we should have that recording up in a week. It takes a little bit longer. Um, we have, a, uh, for those of you that are new to these webinars, we we have a uh, YouTube uh, TV channel uh, for the work that we do here. And uh, so you'll be able to uh, uh, watch this and, and help you go to sleep at night. Um, and uh, uh, we have a lot more on the, the Impact Handbook that, that's online and we're working on better ways for it to be presented also. So, um, so Nathan, you've been, I, I can see you've been sending out links to the audience and I yes. appreciate it. And, uh, again, um, we're going to try to move this regular, uh, impact site impact webinar, which will include, uh, things like trip generation, uh, access management, uh, site design. Uh, if you have something you would like to share with the state, um, we, you know, uh, we're going to have uh, guest speakers. Um, those of you that uh, know me know that uh, I'm uh, a big um, uh, fan of the Mike on Traffic um, website. If you've never heard of it, Google Mike on Traffic and uh, you will get uh, the, uh, a blog of a, of a transportation engineer from Minneapolis who is, uh, seems to be on the cutting or bleeding edge of a lot of issues that we face, and um, he will be a guest speaker sometime in the next three months, uh, possibly talking on trip generation. Uh, possibly talking on site impact analysis. All right. Um, Duane? Hey, uh, well, that was a great show. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I, I learned a lot watching that. It's been uh, interesting to me working in Florida as a, as a planning consultant and then coming over here and, and having uh, seen access management from sort of the outside on the, on the consulting side. Uh, to see how it's changed uh, as we come along, and uh, and uh, I think you're doing a great job sort of moving this ahead. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to point out, I'm, I'm not sure who all exactly is on the call and, and the kinds of things that people are doing uh, in their jobs, but 
it occurred to me that um, if we had something like this in the works when, when I was in the private sector doing these things, I remember you know going and, and trying to find the IT trip generation tables for things. And you're like, well, this is a this is a mixed-use building in the downtown area. How on earth do I make the IT numbers work out for this? Um, I really think that as we proceed with this context-based design approach, it, it will actually make things easier for a lot of us in the ways that we do our jobs. Because what we have now is really situations where we're measuring things in ways that don't fit, mm -hmm. and we're trying to generate numbers for things that really don't tell us what we what we really want to know for those places, um, and knowing where we are in space through a context-based system, I think, is going to make it really easier for everyone to do their jobs. I'm hoping folks aren't thinking of this as like another you know, layer of stuff that's going to be in the way. To me, it's going to clear out a whole bunch of things. Um, there's a diagram we're looking at that District uh, 7, the freight folks down there, have come up with for freight-based design guidelines, and it has a great diagram in their system of um, how decisions are made about design criteria. And it's a little brand, they call it the uh, cauliflower diagram, because it looks like like a piece of cauliflower when you put it out and it has one stem that you start with looking at something and then depending on which decision you make at the next point, you eliminate a whole range of stuff that you don't have to worry about anymore and you keep doing this and it's a reductive process and it gets you down to a fairly small set of options that you really have to worry about but you can only do that, or you can do it more easily if you have a context-based system that you're working from. So I, I think that's the real power of all this and ultimately it will make things, I believe, easier for, uh, for us to all do what we're trying to get get down here, so whether it's improving safety or just, you know, trying to get your, your transportation study done and, and out the door and, and get paid for it. So <laughs> that's important too. Uh, and so, you know, we all have the things that we're trying to get done and uh, I think this will be easier for everyone. Great. And uh, I, I did not put the links on here, but we will uh, put the links on our website. We uh, uh, we have a lot of materials up there. Probably so many, so so many things that it becomes confusing, and that's why I recommend that if you're looking for something, just to, to email me, and uh, we can get it back to you. So, Dwayne, thank you very much. I appreciate you being you. here as a support for me. <laughs> and uh, um, with that. Uh, um, any of my my panelists, uh, if you have anything to add or questions that have come in, let me know. All right. There was just one question asking about the YouTube channel. Uh, we'll have a link included to that in the follow-up email. But um, the Gary, what when is the next webinar date? Well, the next webinar date, since we're going to be going to the second. Thursday of the month should be the 10th of March. Okay, great. And I believe you are working on possibly our next speaker. I, I am actually. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Mike on uh, Mike's back. Uh, him and Brian from Mike on Traffic. They're going to be uh, at, on the April 14th webinar. So that's whenever they'll be. Uh, Okay. Okay. So yeah. Okay. It won't be the the very next one. And uh, okay. Um, and you know, sometimes if we can't come up with uh, with something, we'll we'll cancel too. But uh, it was uh, it was Maria Cahill's idea that I do this presentation, and uh, I was pleased that uh, um, she gave me uh, that recommendation to actually. Uh, to actually do the presentation that I've been doing. Um, yeah, we have a YouTube uh, channel which contains lots of uh, our material. Um, I am trying to get at it. And, um, but once again, ah, there it is, my channel. And I'll, Show the screen as soon as I, I. Okay, I guess I will not try because this again, this is uh, my my computer has has uh, slowed down to the speed of nothing. Uh, well, here it is. 
there is uh, my channel and you can see at the top that we have uh, many of our, our webinars that have been recorded. Uh, we have webinars on the Site Impact Handbook, also on uh, one of my favorites is the uh, series of webinars done by the Center for Urban Transportation Research on what to expect when you're expecting a bypass, and that's a bypass highway. Um, so uh, we will get you that um, link to this and uh, hope you have enjoyed and gotten something out of this. And of course, get with me, uh, any of us via email with any other questions. So do have a great weekend and really appreciate your interest in, in our talk here today. So with that, I will end the presentation. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Gary.